Welcome to our session on platform performance optimization for AI. We are going to optimize model inference here. And uh, this is now from the resource management perspective inside a node. My name is Antti Kervinen. I work for Intel. And uh, I've been dealing with this resource management, node resource management topic for a couple of years now. And here's Dixita. My name is Dixita. You can call me Dixie. I go by that alias. And I work for Google and I'm an active contributor to Signode community. So for this session, I want to point out that running AI workloads can get expensive really fast, specifically the LLM uh, inference models. So these workloads can have uh, different resource usage patterns. For example, some could be CPU bound, while the others could be memory bound, and while some could just have uh, spiky resource needs. So in this session, we are going to walk over how you can utilize the maximum out of your hardware, how you can unlock the maximum potential. So if you understand the resource usage patterns of your workloads, you can place them strategically such that there is minimum to no uh, resource contention. For example, you could just place your workloads to, uh, to be allocated CPUs from different cores such that there is no interference and that could help you uh, unlock the maximum potential from your hardware. So for our experiment, uh, we are using this chatbot. It's just a RAT pipeline, which has all these typical components, uh, the query component, embedding, vector database, LLM, relevant data, and so on. So these components can be uh, Kubernetes microservices in themselves. We are specifically focusing on the LLM uh, inference component. So you could have multiple replicas of this component running. And in the experiment, we'll see how placing the replicas on the node strategically can help you uh, optimize the hardware potential. So in our experiment, the goal is to balance the latency, throughput, and the resource usage such that everything is optimal as much as possible. Um, the first step of our experiment is we are preparing the data collection. We have a third party uh, Python library, which we are using to collect the data. And we are also augmenting it, modifying it a bit to add some instrumentation that's useful for our uh, experiment results analysis. The next step is we run the tests on the instrumented data. And we visualize these uh, in the middle of the show because we want to see if there is anything that needs to be corrected or if there is any strategy that is giving us poor benchmarks than our references. We correct them and uh, we run the experiment with the corrected values. So after we have run the experiments, we analyze the data and we draw conclusions from it. So I'll walk over the prepare uh, data collection step uh, and deep dive into it, how we are instrumenting the data and Anti will walk over the other steps. So if you were to, uh, we are using a Python library, uh, the third party uh, Python library for data collection. And if you were to uh, import a third party library and call a function uh, in it, you would just import that library and call that function in a simple way. Now Python helps you to even modify, like it goes a bit further and help you modify this uh, function and add your custom logic uh, by using this decorator uh, wrapper pattern. So we are walking over the simple example before we walk over the complex ones to explain how this works. So in this example, you see that uh, there is the same third party library, which has this function, which is just printing uh, the function name. You have your main program in which you're calling this function from the library. Now what you want to do is you want to print a statement before the function is called and print a statement after the function is called. So what you will do is you add a wrapper uh, method and pass your main function, uh, the original function as a parameter, print uh, something, cust some custom logic before it, call the function, print some custom logic after it. Now this line is where the magic happens. Um, you pass your original function lib.func in the wrapper, and then you assign the value that's returned from this uh, wrapper to the original function. This is how uh, you can use the decorator pattern to modify the third party libraries without actually modifying them. Uh, now we'll walk over the complex example which we are using in our uh, experiment. This is our MyChart application. This is basically, uh, we are using the uh, hugging face uh, tokenizer transformer library. 
and we are using the uh, GPT Neo 2.7b to generate the text, and we are passing that to the streamer library, and that streamer will print the, uh, stream the output um, for the experiments. So now the streamed output, we wanted to add some timestamps to it so that we can analyze it carefully for our experiments. So this is, this, there is a method uh, in the streamer library, in the streamer object, it's the put method. What this does is every time the model generates the text, it calls the put method, which decodes whatever text the model has generated into a human re readable form. So now for this decoded text, we are attaching the timestamps and we are passing this uh, put as a parameter to this wrapper function, which makes sure that it adds the timestamps uh, to the data that's useful for our experiments. Here is a link to Anthe's uh, repository, which has the complete code of this experiment. And Anthe will talk about the text, test experiments and the results. Thanks. Okay, so, that you, so now you have probably idea that how we can instrument and add timestamps inside uh, Python libraries, in the transformer libraries, without touching the source code of those libraries. Uh, I'll show something else as well. So we are, in addition to gathering timestamps from there, we are also gathering some system metrics in our benchmarks. So these include the standard stuff from under the PROC file system, like NUMA maps, saying that how much of the memory that our inferences are using are allocated from different NUMA nodes. And also PROC bit status is quite interesting because there we can see if there is like uh, context switches or what's the CPU pinning of the process and how much it consumes memory at which point. For those who are interested in uh, more like hardware counters, I would give a tip to check out this kind of PCM project, uh, that's Performance Counter Monitor project, because with those tools that are included in this, you can find it in from the GitHub. So for, with those tools, you can get uh, counters like cache misses, cache hits, cache occupancy, uh, instruction counts and PCI bandwidth and whatnot. So quite quite interesting low level counters. Okay, and all this data that we are collecting from the system and the instrumented timestamps from the transformer libraries, we store store in the raw format so that we can then post process and count the token intervals for instance from there. Why we are not uh, storing token intervals right away? The reason is that if we can find some performance fluctuations during the benchmark, then we can match using these timestamps uh, uh, to the system data so that we can find that what, what could be causing, for instance, performance degradation. Okay, then to the real tests. Um, so, um, we are giving the same prompt to the LLM uh, within different parameter combinations, and these parameters now are from the of the four next forms. So um, there is a number of parallel LLM, LLM inferences running on the node. Uh, so that's a basically a replica count because we used a single node cluster for this case. Uh, then there is a sub NUMA clustering, which is a bias option, selling that uh, how many NUMA nodes should be exposed from the uh, processor that we are using, which is here a fifth gen Xeon process, two socket system, 256 CPUs on that uh, uh, server. And then uh, last two options, so we choose the number and variate the number of logical CPUs that we are allocating for each LLM inference container. And that number ranges from four up to 256 CPUs. And uh, then also we uh, switch on and off this kind of option that whether we are going to allocate both hyper threads from each physical CPU core in the server, or are we going to allocate only one hyper thread per core and leave the other unused. 
and how we are doing the last two options. We are using the balloons resource policy from NRI plugins for that. And for those who NRI plugins or the balloons resource policy are new, here is how they connect to the Kubernetes stack on the node. So uh, both containerd and cryo runtimes uh, implement this NRI uh, interface, sort of in NRI server, where NRI, NRI plugins can register to. So these NRI plugins can be managed by Kubernetes, so they can run in the containers, and they can be system managed processes, and they can be even container runtime managed processes, so that NRI framework itself starts those up. In our case, this NRI balloons resource policy is a uh, we run it as a daemon set, so it's a separate container there that registers to the container runtime and listens to what is happening. And when Kubelet tells that now that we are creating a new container for for LLM inference, then this NRI balloons policy answers that, hey, put it on those CPUs. So cre create a balloon out of these four CPUs, for instance, and put the LLM inference there. So the container runtime then gives this information in OCI to the whole level runtime, which then writes it to the uh, C groups, CPUs and .CPUs. And that's why, how we get the CPU pinning. And that's how we can control, are we using both hyperthreads or one hyperthread per physical core, for instance. Okay, now let's start visualizing the data. Short reminder. This is performance data. If you try this at home, you might get a bit different data or the same data, but this is at least the data that we got. So in x-axis, we have uh, the number of inferences that are running in parallel on the node. On y-axis, we have a multiplier of the latency where the x, 1x means that here we are using all the CPU power for a single inference that is running on the node. So all 256 CPUs are allocated for the same um, inference run. Um, title is going to be the number of CPUs that we are using for each inference. So for instance here we have eight CPUs in use, one inference running, and we can see that here, if we are using the blue one, that is one hyperthread per core, we get only double the latency compared to the situation where we would be running on all 256 CPUs. If we use both hyperthreads per core, then the latency is bigger. Okay, and we are going to have many of these boxes in these visualizations because we are repeating the same test runs many times to see that if there is variation there, and there might be a bit different number of the little boxes because we have not run every single parameter set equally many times. So that explains the sort of holes in these graphs. And the more opaque this box is, the more data points is there. Okay, now that you see how the data is visualized, then let's go analyzing it. So here, we have uh, 4, 8, 16, and 24 CPUs per inference, and currently running only one inference on the node. And here we can observe that if we move from 4 to 8 CPUs, we can get much better latency. Uh, from 8 to 16 CPUs, the improvement is still clear. From 16 to 24, there is not that much improvement anymore. And if we want to squeeze the latency down to the one, then we need uh, 160 CPUs on the toast. So here, the takeaway from this analysis is that perhaps spending all the 256 CPUs for a single inference is not quite optimal. Indeed, as, as we see that we can get the best um, latency already with 160 CPUs and after that, adding more CPUs for that inference container doesn't help at all. The other analysis 
we are analyzing now the number of parallel inferences running on that node. So let's add two, four, and eight concurrent inferences. And here you can see already like uh, that if we are using four CPUs per inference, the latency does not really grow much even if we are running eight uh, inferences in parallel. But if we would be using eight CPUs per inference, then the infer latency growth is pretty clear from four CPUs to, sorry, from four concurrent inferences to eight concurrent inferences. But let's, before analyzing that too far, let's see that what happens here, because it seems that we have like three speed categories of um, inferences. So latency is pretty much split in three. And what, what is causing that um, in the post-processing analysis, we can find that, okay, in some cases we have such a placement of workloads so that when we are using uh, two, uh, sorry, yeah, this is a two socket system. So we are using SNC off, which means that there is no sub NUMA nodes. Each socket is its own NUMA node. So we got, we happen to have a placement where, where um, uh, three of out of four inferences were put on the one socket and then one inference was running on the other socket. And this one inference that got its own socket, it was running very fast, so there was a very low latency. And in this case, where we have three running on the same socket, then that gives a bit and clearly higher, higher um, latency. But in the case where we had SNC, SNC mode two, which means that every socket is seen as two NUMA nodes, uh, in this case, uh, we got placement where uh, every inference it was running in its own NUMA node, which means that it actually got its own memory controller and it was uh, communicating with, with, on its own memory DIMMs. So they are very, they give very stable results. And also uh, this sub NUMA node helps then uh, spreading these containers more evenly. Of course, here is, we had actually some glitch which caused that the uh, third, third uh, or fourth uh, inference was put to the same socket as two before and not to the socket where it was only one, one inference running. So this is not like apples to apples comparison. So that was, that was due to having, having some um, back, back plane, control plane uh, workloads also allocated on the, that node with different uh, resource requirements. But anyway, the takeaway is that well, this SNC mode, subnuma node, uh, that protects these inferences from interference from the same socket. So actually, if I go a bit back, um, you can see in one single inference case here is also some strange things happening. And it looks a bit weird because there are two categories of speed. And it turned out that this is four NUMA node case. So we were running one inference only on that uh, server, but it was running and utilizing basically memory and CPUs only from one NUMA node. So it got exactly the same latency as later on this case where we had four inferences and each was running on its own NUMA node. So it's pretty good protection from what is happening in the environment, whether or not it produces uh, speed. Uh, that's another question then. Okay, then to the bad ideas. Um, one thing that we were vari variating, as I explained earlier, was that how many uh, hyperthreads we are allocating from each physical core. And as long as we are using le less than half of the CPUs from the system, this works pretty fine because then we can always find a physical core which has 
free, two free hypersets, and we can pick up only one of those. But when we are getting and using more CPUs, then we are getting this kind of situation on the, like in the left hand side, that we are running two different inferences on two um, hyperthreads of the same physical core, and that turned out to give pretty bad performance. It was clearly worse than the case where we were allocating both hyperthreads for the same um, physical core. So we are next we are analyzing only the two remaining cases where we either use both hyperthreads for the same uh, inference or we allocate both hyperthreads for the same inference but use only one of those. And let's see how it looks in these visualizations. So these um, dots that are attached with the arrow, they both uh, use four physical cores from the system. In the eight CPU case, we have eight CPUs, but they are like eight hyperthreads from four physical cores. And the blue one in the four CPU case is that we have four uh, physical cores use, using one hyperthread from each. And as you can see, the arrow points down. So uh, we get lower latency whenever we use these, leave the other um, logical core hyperthread idle. And the same, it, it is not dependent on the number of CPUs, so we can see the same pattern also with all, all the other CPU combinations that we were running. So the takeaway here is a nice special offer, like pay two, take one. So even if we allocate like I re request resources, eight CPUs for this container. It's better to use only four of those for the inference because then we get lower latency. Finally, analyze, analyzing this node throughput. So how many tokens we get out from that uh, node in total. So we start it with one replica running on the node, so one inference only. And when we used, in this case, eight CPUs for that, and let's concentrate on the blue marking studies, we used eight physical cores for that. That results in um, the double the latency compared to the case where we have all the CPUs in use, which means, of course, that we have only half of the throughput compared to the case that we are using all the CPUs. But when we are increasing the number of, um, of these uh, inferences on the same node to two, uh, the balloons policy will place the other inference on the other socket on, in this two socket machine, and they both run without any inference, uh, interference between uh, each other, which means that we get exactly double the throughput. So now the throughput is in par with the case where we are using all the CPUs for single inference. Furthermore, if we are increasing again for replicas, now we are almost already the double the throughput of use all CPUs to one inference case. And again, if we use eight parallel inferences, then there starts to be interference, so that we are not getting any more than double the throughput, but we get almost pretty much the triple the throughput to the uh, reference case, so all CPU case. So the takeaway for the balance, that was one of our goals, is that we can actually triple the server no, uh, token throughput if we run eight inferences in parallel on CPU uh, and for that we actually are using only half of the uh, CPUs available in that node which leaves a lot of CPUs available for the other part, parts of the rack pipeline for instance so for the database and for the other inferences. All right let's start wrapping up. So these are the points takeaways from the methodology. So if you are uh, benchmarking Python, Python programs, it's uh, possible to 
uh, instrument these Python libraries without, without actually touching their code. You can do that uh, in your own main program, which imports the libraries that the real original main program imports, and then not just overwrite the fun functions with wrappers and do whatever you like in those wrappers, like print, print these timestamps. Regarding the data, it turned out to be very handy to uh, have all data raw timestamped because that gave us freedom even to change what we are exactly measuring. So, for instance, when we were starting these eight um, inferences in parallel, not all of them started producing tokens at the same time, of course. But because we were storing the raw timestamps from each of the tokens, we were able to, po in the post-processing phase, see that at that point all of them are producing tokens and until that po point they are all producing tokens and we were measuring the token latency between those time, po um, time points only, which gives pretty nice uh, results for the benchmarking because there is much less variance and we, we can concentrate on the case that is heaviest for the CPU. Uh, regarding utilities and examples, the PCM tool is in interesting for low-level hardware-related metrics. OPIA examples gives nice examples for benchmarking, uh, so that you can just apply apply some YAMLs and then you get the full rack pipeline running on your node and in your cluster. And uh, take away from resource management, so we were using NRI resource policies for controlling and variating that these options that how to how to manage containers and with how to pin CPUs. Uh, Takeaways from the CPU inference part: uh, 256 CPUs is way too. It's very suboptimal for a single inference. It's better to split it in part. Numa nodes were protecting. Uh, inferences from interfering with each other. Hyperthreads, it seems to better to pay to take one for the best performance. And regarding the balance, we were able to triple the server throughput by using only half of the CPUs of the server. So this concludes our presentation. You can find these examples for instrumenting Python code and you can find the balloons policy uh, configuration example and how to install balloons policy from these links. And then there are, these are the links for this presentation and then there are external links for the OPIA project and PCM tool and NRI plugins. Okay, thank you for your attention. Are there any questions in mind? Questions this time. Okay, so the question is about should we disable hyperthreading? Um, that's a great question, thanks. So, uh, what you can do with balloons policy is that you can assign these um, inference containers to these kind of balloons, a set of CPUs where hyperthreading is disabled practically for those CPUs. But still, in the rack pipeline, you have many other workloads as well, and you might be running many other workloads on the same node, like databases and whatnot, which actually benefit from hyperthreading. And with this kind of resource policy, you are able to disable hyperthreading on those containers that actually take a hit from it, and the rest can use it on their cores. Going to run database on the other hyper thread, then it's going to interfere with this inference. Uh, so, uh, can this database then in, uh, interfere with this inference? Not actually, because what we were doing, we, we were allocating both hyper threads for this inference, but giving only one. So, the other one was allocated, but not used, and it could not be used by any other container in the node either. So, 
that that's what we were able to do with this resource policy. Thanks for the presentation. <clears throat> Quick question. You just showed this synthetic example when you run just inference. Have you run similar kind of tests when you run not only inference but everything else just to fulfill the node as much as you can? Yes, we have run these kind of tests as well. And uh, maybe uh, I'll ask you to come to the Intel booth. <laughs> so, so there we have actually a demo where we are running the whole pipeline. And what we have done in this kind of uh, tests is also that we have used some uh, uh, sort of scaling. So if we can recognize that there's a um, yeah. pipeline is getting, uh, the queue is getting longer for the LLM inference, for instance, then we can uh, create another replica there and run it on the same node. And at that point, it's very important also to manage these CPUs so that they run on different CPUs which enables us to scale really many replicas on the same node. So, and in those cases, we have managed the CPUs so that we have basically used a bunch of CPUs to run all the con, um, databases and these user interfaces and whatnot, other microservices, and have dedicated CPUs then only for this LLM and other like embedding and re-ranking in inferences that are in the same pipeline. Thanks for clarifying. Thanks.